Gordon Yopola. So tomorrow uh, we'll have the liturgy starting at 8.15. The Orthros will start at 8.15, the liturgy at 9.30. So please join us tomorrow. <clears throat> but already you can see there's this kind of uh, bittersweet joy, kind of the same, same feeling we have uh, during Holy Week. <clears throat> so we're laying the Mother of God to sleep, but we know that she'll be uh, immediately translated into life. Father Mike is going to say a couple words to us about the feast, but I just wanted to note really quickly, <clears throat> uh, you know, big feasts like this, the, the church, uh, usually the monks and the priests who compose all these hymns for the church, you know, they, there's such devotion to the Mother of God, and they're so happy about these feasts that it really brings out the finest. So the, the finest achievements of, of the great empire of Byzantium are really expressed in the artistic achievements uh, that we see in the feasts of the church. The greatest poetry of the Greek language is expressed usually to the Theotokos, to the Mother of God. Uh, uh, the, the greatest music, the greatest art, uh, all these things. So you see even tonight, you know, all, how all of us have come together to offer the best of what we have to the Mother of God. So for example, look at this beautiful epitaphion that the, the ladies decorated with fresh flowers that they got today. This is the the most beautiful thing they can offer to decorate her tomb for her. <clears throat> this evening, one of the hymns called the Doxastikon uh, that we chanted earlier is one of the most difficult compositions in Byzantine music because it goes through, there are eight different modes and within the space of a single song, it goes through all eight modes. And this is like the decathlon of Byzantine chanting. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> my, my wife, I was practicing for many days now <clears throat> to, try to, to try to sing this. Finally, she, she asked Nicholas, please come. And this is, the, this is something that takes really years of training and practice to be able to sing a composition like this, let alone to, to make it. So, in, and look, when you come up here to venerate at the end, to venerate the epitaphion of the Mother of God, look how beautiful the, the embroidery is. I mean, so this is the, the finest that we, the church, have to offer to the Mother of God. It's a beautiful thing. Father... It's uh, very humbling to say any words after a service like this with hymns like this that it would probably be best for you and for me if I just turned around and went back in and you came up and venerated our Panagia. But in my mind, I've been going over again and again for the better part of the day a saying from know people are going to, my favorite saint, Nicholas Cavasilas. He said that our Lord created the world. He created the universe and all that is in it for but one purpose, that in it he might find for himself a mother that the son who for all eternity had a father but no mother created the world that he might find for himself a mother. And all of those beautiful stories of the Old Testament, all of those attempts to get closer to God, all of the failures and the successes, everything was a garden that was being tended, striving for a single plant to come forth, a flower that might be worthy of God. Because indeed, as, as Father Gregory expressed so beautifully, all of the glories of Byzantium, all of its art and all of its culture has tried to give and offer to the Mother of God something that would be worthy of her, and all she has done for us. And yet all of it in the final analysis fails to even hint at her beauty. And in fact, of all that we have ever offered to God, I would say the one thing that we've offered and given to him that was truly worthy of him was the mother that he sought from the beginning. 
So on this feast of the Chimisis, the Dormition, the falling asleep of the Theotokos, we remember the event of how later in her years, the apostles, they were all spread out, the church was growing, and yet though in the scriptures, much is silent about her, we know that she was in many ways that silent bedrock that was holding up the apostles that they would go to her and that she would sometimes even go to them to give to them a blessing. She was like the Yerondisa, the eldress to these holy apostles. And that when the time for her to be reunited to her son came, our Lord sent to her to a second evangelismos, a second good news, and sent Gabriel to announce that he would come again, and he would come for her. And so she prepared herself, and they say that, and in one of the hymns it says so beautifully, by the command of God, the God-bearing apostles everywhere were transported through the skies upon clouds. So that in the thunderclap, all of the apostles but one, that's a story for another day, were gathered together around the Theotokos, that they might receive from her a final blessing before her departure to the heavens. And that they were all present when Christ came and we have that image, this icon that you'll see when you venerate the epitaphio that to me is one of the most profoundly moving. Because in every home, in every church, we see that image of the Panagia holding Christ the child. And in many of these icons, Christ himself like a small child is embracing her. There's the icon called the glicophilo, the, the sweet kissing icon. And in this icon, we see Christ holding his mother's soul as an infant with the same embrace that she has always embraced him. For all of that human history before the Annunciation, before God began his journey of our salvation, earth awaited its king. And this is what we were missing. This is what caused the world so much distress from that first murder of Cain and Abel to the Tower of Babel. Our king was not here to bring to us peace. And if we think about it, the earth was without king. Again, St. Nicholas says that the earth was without king and Christ was a king without its city. But we could also again say that heaven had a king but no queen. And it is on this day that not just we here on earth, but perhaps even more so, the angels celebrate the reception of their queen. And I will conclude with reading the rest of that hymn that Nicholas chanted so beautifully and Father spoke of. By the command of God, the God-bearing apostles everywhere were transported through the skies on clouds. And reaching your all-immaculate body, that origin of life, they kissed it in grand veneration. The supreme hosts of heaven arrived with their master. Seized with awe, they ushered your inviolate body which had hosted God. High above the earth, they went before you. And invisibly they shouted to the angelic orders above them, Behold the queen of all, the maid of God has arrived. Lift up the gates and give a formal heavenly reception to the mother of the everlasting light. For the salvation of all humanity came through her. We are unable to gaze on her and it is impossible to bestow worthy honor on her. Her excellence surpasses all understanding. Therefore, O Immaculate Theotokos, as you now live forever with the life-bearing King who is your Son, intercede unceasingly that he guard us, your children, and that he save us from every hostile assault since we are under your protection. And to the ages with splendor we call you blessed. Amen.